So we're going to talk about file types now. And uh, I'm sure you're all well aware of uh, shapefiles. So shapefiles are the one that have been used sort of historically. They're quite an old format now. Um, a lot of people are moving away from shapefiles um, just because there's some limitations that we won't go into here. Um, so shapefiles, they are uh, a number of files. If you've ever looked in a project folder, um, one that's got some shapefiles in, you'll notice there's like a whole bunch of random files um, with all kind of the same name. So there's a few different parts. There's, there's the .shp, sorry, these are random bits of paper that I've just found lying around my office. Um, we've got the .shp, imagine that one there. Uh, we've got a .dbf, which is some sort of database, I don't know. Um, sometimes you'll have a PRJ projection file. Um, sometimes there'll be XML or some other random stuff. But essentially, shapefile is just made up of these like four plus files um, that are just into your folder somehow. Um, and that's, that's a bit of a mess. Um, that's one of the limitations. So if you've got a lot of shapefiles for one project, um, that soon adds up and your folder is just full of stuff that's just chucked in there. Um, and if you are sending a shapefile to somebody, if you don't send them all the bits, it all breaks. Um, so shapefiles, not particularly ideal. Um, looks messy, breaks easily. Um, so I'm trying to get people to move away from that. So the alternative is something called a geo package. And this is something that QGIS is kind of trying to roll out a bit more. I pick my stuff up off the floor. Um, so a geo package is uh, a little bit more uh, neat in, in the way that it's stored. So we've got all of your, your bits. So instead of this all being one bunch of files that goes with one map, uh, each one of these now is a different layer. So this could be our phase one habitat. Uh, this one could be a bat survey. This one could be a wintering bird survey. This one could be a red line boundary. You get the idea. I feel like the red one should be a red line. So we've got all of these different things, and instead of just being kind of chucked into the folder, um, they all go into their own little nice poly pocket like that. There we go. And then there's all of our all of our map layers, and they're all nicely held together, and that's put in the project folder. So instead of having like 30 plus files just waving around in your GIS folder, you've got one. Um, just looks a lot neater, uh, keeps it all together. If you try and send it to someone else, it doesn't just break and you end up with bits everywhere. Um, just keeps it a bit neater. So geo packages, really the way that I'm trying to uh, encourage people to go. So with that all out of the way, um, I've created a, a geo package that's kind of ready to drop in for uh, most projects, or at least it can be adapted for most GIS projects. Um, specifically, it's for phase one habitat surveys, um, but it can be adapted to other things too. So it's in the same location as the templates, um, which by now you should have mapped to your OneDrive. Um, if not, see that video previously. So here's my, my templates folder. And we looked at symbols last time, and we've looked at templates for the print composer already. And now we're going to look at this last one here, phase1.gpkg. <coughs> so one thing you're going to do is copy this to your folder. You're not going to change it here because otherwise it changes it for everybody else. Um, yeah, and then it's, uh, someone else can touch it and fiddle with it and then it's broken. So 100% make sure you're copying this. Ooh, hello copying this to your project folder. So here I've just got one called test. I've created a GIS folder inside it. And I'm just gonna paste it in here. And just to make sure that I know I'm editing the right one, I'm gonna rename it with the project code, which in this case is test. So this is the project we're gonna work on. I'm just going to copy and paste this into QGIS. Well, actually, I'm just going to drag it into QGIS like that. And it's going to ask us which layers we want to add. Now, the way that I've ordered them is kind of the best way that it'll render. So when it comes to actually put it on the map at the end, the way that I've ordered them just means that nothing important is being covered by something else, essentially. So the red line boundary is at the top because this one you can always see around the edges. Target notes then, points, 
then lines, then polygons. So polygons can kind of cover any other thing, so they're right at the bottom usually. So we just want all of them for now. There we go, they've loaded in. So we've got our red line boundary, target notes, points, lines, polygons. So if we start with our red line, let's just choose a random random place. I don't know where this is, but we're going to go here. So you'll either have uh, a plan, which you can geo-reference, or you'll have maybe some CAD files. Um, you might also just be winging it. But anyway, the first thing you do is you geo-reference. Sorry, you don't. <laughs> first thing you do is you draw on your red line. So we're going to stick the pencil on, start editing, and we're going to go for uh, this area around here. So you want to be a lot more accurate than I am. I'm doing this very quickly, just for a video. Um, there we go. <clears throat> and you'll notice it's got some categories already there. So it's got the author, which is me. Um, it's got the date that it was created and the date it was updated, which are the same because it's just been added. So this just adds a bit of uh, accountability to every bit of data we create. So the name on it, the author, is automatically set up to take the username from the computer. So this is my computer. Um, I'm logged in as David Kaplan, so it's put my name on it. Anytime somebody else makes a change, so let's say I change that line there, it'll update that layer. Name's still the same because it's still me. Um, but the updated date will have changed. So 12.59 it was created, 12.59 in 53 seconds it was updated. Let's undo that. So that just makes, um, <clears throat> gives a yeah, bit more traceability to the data so we know kind of when stuff was made, um, if it's been changed, who changed it, that kind of thing. So that's our boundary. We could then start doing our, our area habitats. So I'm going to switch that on. Now before I carry on, because I could just start drawing stuff like that. But we're going to get these big gaps like that. And even if I'm trying to be really accurate and I'm trying to do you know, a good, a good job like that, you're still going to end up with, like here, there's a bit of a gap there. Here it's overlapping, so let's remove all of that. What we need to use is snapping. So if we right click up here, and we're gonna find snapping toolbar, and we're just gonna make sure that's switched on. So we're gonna little magnet, and we're gonna snap it to these top three here. Vertex, which are the little points, segment, which is the line between the points, or area, the kind of the bit in the middle. We're also going to make sure we switch on this one and we're going to put it on avoid overlap and we're going to switch on this one. So what these things do, this one here will allow you to snap uh, where two lines cross. The one over here, if you click on like here on this line here, it'll add a point to that line as well. And the overlap just means that if we do that, where it's overlapping, it'll snip it to the edge. So it won't let us overlap them because we shouldn't really be having habitats that overlap. Uh, let's get rid of you. So we're snapping on, we can start to put our habitats in. So I'm going to do one around the edge. is going to be, I guess, semi-improved. Field margin. And again, we've got some bits in here that are auto-filled. So we've got the name again. We've got the date created, the date updated. There's a little section for comments as well if you want to put them in. You don't have to. It's entirely up to you. An area here, which is automatically calculated. This will update if you change the shape, if you put in another one, anything like that, 
um, the area should always update itself to be the right area. There you go. Let's put a bit of arable in here. I'm not going to do this properly, I'm just kind of clicking wherever I fancy. Now, we could go along and kind of try and click along this line, or we can use one of the snapping tools, which is this little lightning here, which is tracing. So if I go back to there, to use tracing, what we're going to do, we're going to click like we did there on that, that last vertex, that last point of this polygon. And then we're going to go, let's go part way along for now. Now you can see it's trying to draw in, there's a little red line on the screen there, just between the last point and where my cursor is now. If we put that onto the, ooh, there we go, there's a little, the squares are points, the crosses are lines, just so you know. Um, we're going to put that onto this point here. And my little red line is now following the line of that previous polygon. It's going along here. So it's snapped to that previous line. So what we're going to do, we've done one part way. We're going to go towards the end. Where's the last one? About there. Uh, arrow. So that line now follows the other one perfectly. It's sharing the same points along the polygon. So if we were doing all of them like this and all of the edges are shared and there's no weird little slivers, and there's no overlaps, the total area of the habitat should equal the total area of the red line, which is what we'd expect. That's what, we, that's what we're hoping for. Um, this is going to be important when we're doing stuff like BNG um, because the areas need to match. If the areas aren't matching, we're going to get errors. So. This is one way of ensuring that our, our habitat areas are equal to, to the overall red line boundary using snapping and making sure there's no little gaps. So this one here, let me turn tracing off. Um, this one here, we have to make sure we close that and obviously there's the, the rest of it to do as well. So that, save that. <coughs> that's how you add uh, polygons in. There is some verification on adding new things, I think. Let me double check. Uh, I can't quite remember what verification's on though. Is gap on? No. That's on though. Oh, it's not. Okay, never mind, ignore me. Um, you may get some error messages Delete that and that and that. Yeah, you may get some error messages. So, for example, um, if I do a polygon that is invalid, like that, you can see what I've done. It kind of backs over itself, so it's not an okay polygon. If I create that, it's going to give us a little message here, and it's going to say there's a problem. Um, and it's not going to let us save it until we've rectified this problem. So here, it intersects itself. So we're going to have to use this tool here, the vertex tool, to edit this particular feature. So we're going to have to move these little points out and we're going to have to correct it. There we go, like that, before it lets us save it. So now we can save it, it's all good. But it won't let us save it if there's an invalid geometry. So that's how we put our polygons in. Um, lines, similar kind of thing. We click on the layer we want to edit, click the little pencil, add a new thing. Some hedgerow, uh, obviously give it a better name. So I think there's a hedge along here, isn't there? Um, Ooh, hello. There's a native hedgerow there. It says a ditch running down there. Same kind of thing, and then points. Let's put in a bit of scattered scrub there.
So you'll have noticed, hopefully, as I'm adding all of these things, a few things actually, first one is that the habitat, it's saving the one that we've previously put in. So when you come to put a new one in, it's already there um, with the previous habitat. So if you're doing large areas of immediate grassland first, for example, um, it just saves you a few keystrokes. You don't have to type it in every time. Also minimizes the, the chance of, of writing it in differently the next time. So for example, capitalizing one and having the other one in lowercase. So all of them have that, that we've got here. Um, the other thing is that they all have the author, the date created, the date updated, and most of them have some sort of calculation. So linear features have got a length calculation, this one's 20 meters. Uh, polygons have got a, ooh, of course it's not gonna work because it's overlapping, have got an area calculation. So most of them have got some form of that if you're using this template. Right, let's just save all these. Oops. And then we're gonna color them. So to color them, you right click on the layer, go to properties, symbology. It should be on that automatically. I was just having a look. Um, and then from single symbol, we're gonna to go to categorize. And we're gonna categorize it by the habitat. So drop down, habitat, and then we're gonna go classify. And it'll add in all of the different habitats that we've got. Um, you can either do this as you're going along, or you can do it at the end. It's up to you, really. Um, I like to do it at the end, because I can see more clearly if there's any gaps. Um, but you can do it as and when, really. If you're doing it as you go along, you'll just have to press classify at the bottom every time you add extra ones. Um, and it'll probably add in this all other values one, possibly more than once. So you'll have to just get rid of that. Um, because every time you come and do it, it'll add it again. And then each of these, we want to give the appropriate symbol. So arable down here should be somewhere near the bottom. Let's make it a bit bigger. Arable, there we go. This one here, poor SI. There we go. And there they are. <clears throat> now, some things you might notice is that SI one, for example, is kind of underneath the arable one. And sometimes if you've got a polygon that goes like this around a corner, yeah, we'll have arable for that. Um, you might notice that the, let's try and get it a bit more extreme, there we go. You might notice the letter's actually not in the polygon at all. If that's the case and you don't want it like that, if you edit that symbol, so arable for this example, where it's a centroid fill, which is the letter, we're gonna go force placement of markers inside the polygon. And that will just make that letter go into the polygon. So centroid just means the middle of that polygon. Now if the polygon's a weird shape, that center might actually be outside of the geometry, outside of the polygon. So if you've got a letter C, for example, the middle of the C is kind of here. Um, so if we go force point within the polygon, it'll go into the actual polygon itself, like that. We'll do the same for the SI. Mm, hasn't really changed, but yeah. You can also move them around if you particularly want to, you don't like how it looks. Um, but yeah, that's how we use that template um, and use the styles within it. So it's quite handy to use that template just because everything is set up ready to go. You just drag it into your project, change the name, stick it into QGIS and away you go. It's also got the authors on it, it's got the, the dates on it. So you've got a bit of, um, sort of traceability on the data. Um, and if someone comes in and adds bits, you can see who's added things or changed things, uh, when they've done it and all those sorts of good things. So it's worth using. Um, it just helps keep everything organized and yeah, and, and traceable, and that's how we use it.